Um, I'm going to race through a lot of things here. 30 tips in 60 minutes is, is a lot. Uh, but, um, and all, everything I talk about, don't go out and implement. Pick a few of the ideas that seem to make the most sense if you think any of them are worthwhile uh, and, and use those. This isn't to say these are 30 things you have to do. These are just things to consider as part of your, as part of your marketing mix. Uh, yeah, I'm, I run NARA uh, as an association, but my background is primarily in marketing, both uh, as a business owner as well as in, uh, within association management. So for me, this is kind of a sweet spot. Uh, I, I've spent a lot of time uh, in my career working in marketing. And so hopefully, uh, some of the things that I share will be of some value. Um, was anybody in my earlier session? A couple people, yeah. Uh, be a tiny bit of overlap. Uh, we talked a little bit about the internet and that presence, and that is kind of part of marketing as well. But, but there will be a lot that's not, that, that we aren't, aren't, aren't covering. So with that, I'm hoping to be able to provide you with some ideas that you can use and, and go, home and, uh, go home and implement. But, uh, and, and I was trying to think of some way on, on how to organize things, and this is, the, the ideas are kind of all over the board, but they kind of fall under six general categories, all of which you really can consider marketing. Uh, marketing is really much broader than just, you know, putting together a brochure and mailing it out to people. It's, it's how your business is perceived by your customers, with your brand, so, so to speak. It's, it's your overall plan for business development, not simply the sales and marketing aspect, the sales aspect. It, it encompasses everything related to your business that is intended to help grow your business or in some cases even control costs, but mostly uh, focused on growing your business. And so I kind of organized it in that way. And with that and with the time restraints that we have, let me go ahead and get going. Um, planning is a really important aspect of uh, good marketing effort. Um, many of you probably put together some kind of business plan or a, a work plan for the year in terms of what you're going to do. Um, how many people write a marketing plan or say, you know, here's how we're going to go forward, whether you do it every year or whether you've done it at some point and say, this is what we're going to do? Okay. I would really encourage you to do that and, and to write down kind of what your plan is for growing your business. I mean, it may seem, may seem dumb, but it really does make sense to sit down and kind of think about exactly what what you want to do. And as part of that planning, there are a few steps that are, or a few tips that are included in um, the, this presentation here. And the first one is, and, and again, some of these may seem obvious to you, and I apologize if, if, if I'm talking under your head, so to speak, but I kind of want to start and, and assume that some people maybe aren't aware of this. So, uh, but one, it's really important to, for your image and, and, your, uh, and, and so that your customers understand who they're dealing with, that you have a consistent look and message. Um, and that, you, that, that that's everywhere. It's, you know, it's, it's what you're putting on your trucks and what you're putting on your estimate forms and uh, the sign in front of your, um, your, your headquarters, your offices, wherever, wherever they happen to be. Um, it's, you know, any forms that your customer has to sign off on after they've done a job. They should all kind of fit together so that when you lay everything out that is all the literature and all the uh, you know, maybe even your uniforms, if, if your people have uniforms or hats or whatever. Everything should kind of all have the same look, at least tied together with a logo or something like that. That kind of continuity really ensures that the person that you're dealing with, in whatever context they're dealing with, if they've seen you in another context, they'll, that, that logo and that look will help them remember you and not cause suspicion going forward that maybe I'm not dealing with the same group that I was before. Have a marketing budget. Build that into your overall budgeting. And, and I'll say right off the bat that a, a budget of zero is still a budget. So if you don't want to devote any dollars to marketing, that's fine. Just know that, going, know that going in. But the whole point of having a budget is to say, okay, this is what I feel I can afford to try and grow my business. And come up with a dollar figure that you're comfortable with and try to work within that. That'll do two things. One is it'll enforce some discipline and make you kind of look deeper into exactly what, what are the things that you think are you're best able to accomplish. And, and the other thing it'll do is it'll keep you from going off in 15 different directions. If you have a plan and you stick to it, it's better than if you just kind of go in and, you know, this week you say, well, okay, I'm going to maybe see if I mail out a few postcards if that works. And then next week you say, let me shoot some emails out. And you're all over the board on it. There's no consistency or plan. It really does help to put a budget together because that enforces the discipline of having, having some type of marketing plan that, so that you know if you have a roadmap in terms of where you're going. Now, there's a Dilbert cartoon of mine that's, a, that, that's I'm, I'm really 
uh, very fond of, even though it makes fun of marketing. Uh, and uh, Dilbert is talking to some young kid who says, well, I'm thinking about going into engineering. And Dilbert says, well, that's going to take years and years of training and lots of math and very technical. The guy says, well, maybe I should think about marketing instead. And Dilbert says, well, that's just liquor and guessing. <laughs> and, and there's a little bit of truth to that, but, prob but I, what my goal here is to try and move you beyond the liquor and guessing stage to putting a little bit of the art and science of marketing into what you're doing. And, and there is an art and science to marketing. It's not rocket science, but there, is, there are some plans to it. Um, as part of the plan that you're putting together, develop a schedule of the activities you're going to do, whether it's once a month or once a quarter, or you've got a schedule of uh, you know, shows that you want to go exhibit at, or whatever it might happen to be. But put it down on paper so that you kind of know what's going on, and you're able to plan for it, and you're not doing stuff kind of halfway at the last minute because you forgot that this was coming up. Get it on your calendar, just like you do any of the important other events, whether it's the you know, whether it's paying your taxes, or doing your billings and collections, or whatever, whatever it would happen to be. So planning is very important, but planning only helps if you actually are planning to do something. And, and so let's talk a little bit about a, a bunch of different tactics that you might want to think about employing. And again, some of these obviously you know, but I'm going to try to drill a little bit deeper on those if I can. So number four, um, our direct mail, and I'll talk about Valpac afterwards. Direct mail really is effective, and you know, in, in today's era, more and more people are because it, it's obviously it's a lot less expensive, are doing email marketing um, and, and thinking that all the only thing that you need to do is electronic marketing. And there's a little bit of truth. You know, you can get by with that. Uh, that's okay. Uh, there's nothing. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But in fact, because so many people have gotten out of direct mail and moved into electronic marketing as a substitute. Direct mail actually has gone up in terms of its response over the last decade, uh, you know, average response rates for things. Because things that land in people's mailboxes, first of all, there's less clutter than there used to be uh, in the past, or at least there should be some less clutter in the past. And people do send it, tend to be a little bit more responsive to these because a lot of times you just get you know, 20 emails from your Barnes and Nobles and Best Buys or whatever, and you're just going delete, delete, delete. You don't even care what the message is. It's just get it out of my inbox. There's too much in there right now. So if somebody has time to linger over a direct mail message, that's actually a good thing. Now, um, direct mail is not, is not rocket science, but it really, it, there, there are some things that can help you improve your, uh, if you decide you want to do direct mail, that will help you improve it. Uh, the two most important uh, things about direct mail are a good list and a good offer. Um, you don't necessarily know what a good offer is, and that's kind of where the liquor and guessing comes in. <laughs> so what you really want to do is take your best educated guests to start, and you make that direct mail piece what is called your control package. And that is that this is, this is the package that you'll use until you find something better that generates more response. Well, how do you generate more response? Well, you periodically test different approaches. Uh, uh, with a segment of whatever the audience is that, 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 that you're marketing to. Say you have 5,000 names of people with systems that, uh, or potential, potential customers out in the area that you serve, and you've been able to pull together a list. It could be a carrier out list that you get from the postal service or a list broker, or uh, it might be just a list of names that you've collect, collected over the years. That, that's a pretty good list. Every once in a while, take a portion of that list and set it aside as a, uh, for uh, a, a test mail of a different approach. And the thing that you really want to do is, is, is test one thing about, about the message that's different from whatever your current mailing is. So uh, if, your, uh, if your offer is call us now and get, uh, you know, and we'll give you a 5% discount on completion of the job, uh, that's fine, maybe that, and maybe that's a really good one. But maybe you come up with a different message, and it's that you know we offer you know a no no complaints, no questions asked, money back guarantee. Take a percentage, or like maybe 10 or 15 percent of your mailing list, and, and do do the mailing just like you would normally, but have two different items printed and send that 50, send that test package to 15 percent, and then measure what the response is from that group when it when it comes back. If it's better on a percentage basis than what you've been using. Well, that becomes your control. And then later on, you test something else. But eventually, over time, you continue to test messages until you find a me until you get uh, each time you test something, hopefully, you're going to do a little bit better. But if you're not, that's fine. You haven't wasted a money on an entire mailing. You've only tested a small portion of it. And you'll probably get some response. You just may not get as good a response as what you're getting from whatever your control package is. So direct mail, direct mail can work, but it is expensive. Uh, it's really hard to get 
uh, messages out to people for less than about a dollar a piece. So if you want to commit to this, you are making a commitment, and it's a financial commitment. And, you know, and you've got somebody who's going to design it, and somebody who's going to print it, and somebody who's going to mail it and post it and do all that. And you can do that in house, or you can or you can send it out. But the postage alone, unless you're able to uh, have a volume where you can qualify for a standard mail permit is going to be 42 or 43 cents. That's half your cost right there, just delivering it to people. But on the other, uh, on the other hand, the response rates are much, much better than they are for, uh, for email. Uh, by comparison, and there's lots of different studies, and they're all, they're all kind of over the, all over the board in terms of the specific numbers. But as a rule of thumb, what, I'm, what, what I see in terms of all these different tests is that a good direct mail package can generate anywhere from 2 to 10 percent response from the audience that, you, that, that you're reaching. It's very, very hard to get email over a percent in terms of response for all the reasons I said. People just want to get it out of there. So I'm not saying don't do email. I'm just saying direct mail can be effective and it can be a bigger, it can generate a bigger response, but you really need to have a good list and a good offer in order for it to be effective. And that's why testing has some value. If you continue to repeat over time, you'll continue to improve your response rates. Uh, I mentioned Valpac only because um, in some areas, particularly more the suburban areas around, uh, uh, around the larger towns in, in um, or cities in Iowa, uh, there are groups like Money Mailer and Valpac and whatever that um, may be going to, you, you may be able to use them to go out to a segment of the audience that uh, is, a, is, is a verified list and is a much lower cost. You can do that for, generally speaking, I think about 50 cents per, uh, per item. You, you save a lot on postage in, in particular by going with one of those groups. Uh, of course, you're in a package with a bunch of other people, but and a bunch of other companies and services. But the fact of the matter is, is that the people, you look at those, people are going to look only at the things that they're really interested in. It's just like what they say about antiques. One person's trash is another person's treasure. One person's junk mail is another person's possible answer to a problem they have. And that's, that's kind of the way that you have to look at it. I mean, junk mail is a real pejorative term. And everybody says, well, we, we hate junk mail. Well, we all hate junk mail. We would wish that everybody knew exactly what I wanted and could mail to you only the things that you were really interested in. But that's not how the world works, unfortunately. But Valpac is, is perhaps a good, way, uh, a good way to look at it if your service area tends to be in an area that Valpac or one of those other groups tends to serve. So it's an alternative for you to consider. I mentioned this in the earlier session, but it doesn't hurt to develop a presence on Facebook. It's a way for you to retain, remain linked with your customers. It doesn't cost you anything to do it out of your pocket. The investment is, is time. And as I mentioned earlier today, uh, the, People will, will, will friend you, and, and there's, there's different types of pages you can set up, and, and if you're interested in that, you can come talk to me afterwards. I can give you a little more detail on it. But even if you just have a basic page where you're connecting with people, and you may already have a Facebook page, but you may want to have a page for your company or a group page for your company, and then invite people to join. And if you have a website, you put a little click on there that says follow us on Facebook, too. And then you communicate with, and have a di essentially you're having a dialogue with your customer base or other people who are potentially customers or are just interested in what you do. Uh, you don't have to post every day. You don't have to, you know, even sometimes once a week is fine. You can be yourself, post whatever really appeals to you. I would encourage you not to just every time you send something out, it, it's just, you know, uh, use my service, use my service, use my service, but intersperse it with other things. Uh, there, if you go to uh, Facebook now and go there's a search, little search box at the very top of the Facebook, main Facebook page. And even if you don't have an account, I think you, can, you should be able to find this. But if you go and just type septic in there, you'll get a return of, I don't know, three, 400 companies that are um, in on-site in some fashion. You know, they're, they're pumpers or they're hauler, uh, pumpers or they're installers or they're service providers or whatever. And take a look and see. There's a, I'm impressed by how wide a range it is. I mean, there's customer service. Uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, community service type activities that they're involved in. They try to get their customers to help send somebody to school or, uh, you know, put a roof over someone's head. Uh, other people, uh, you know, do contests or they see something like an interesting video and they'll put that up there, particularly if it's relevant to their business. There's, there's no rules on this, but it's a way to generate dialogue. And the, the nice thing is, is that it, unless you have a fan page, whenever you do a post, it shows up in that person's Facebook 
stream. And so you're having, a, you're having that communication with them along with the sister-in-law who just baked the cherry pie and everything else. And that's just kind of the nature of Facebook. But it's a way to keep your name in front of your customers and it doesn't cost you anything to do. The one thing I would caution you on is if you just put a page up and you never post anything on it, you're wasting your time and you shouldn't bother doing it. You should think about doing it about once a week and if you're not comfortable doing it, maybe there's somebody else in your company who you can say you're our designated Facebook person. But, and you don't have to do it, but it, it's a, it's a low, it's a, the, the cost is the, 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 fin the human cost, no, no financial cost really to do that. So it's, it's worthwhile, to, uh, wor worthwhile to consider that. The only other thing I would say is, is that uh, if you're going to put it up and you're never going to look at your Facebook page, don't bother doing it because what will go up there will be junk um, and it will be disgruntled customers. And the last thing you want is, is say you just posted something uh, yesterday and you don't look at Facebook for three weeks and the day after you posted you have some customer who's upset with you and they're communicating with you instead of picking up the phone and calling you or sending you an email they'll send you a message on Facebook and they expect you to respond believe it or not uh, and, but some people particularly uh, as you go younger um, in, the, in, this, in the age scale people communicate and use Facebook as a primary communication mechanism along with texting that's not the way I communicate but that's the way some people do so it's important to at least periodically just at least look at the page you don't have to add anything just see if anybody's posted anything on there or you can set your privacy level so that you're the only one who can post and nobody can have that then you lose the benefit of having a dialogue with your customers if you want that so anyhow Facebook is number five Number six is have a website. I talked about this earlier today too. There's no reason for you not to have a website with the technology that's out there now. It used to be really hard to put a web page up because you had to know HTML programming or you had to use some really complicated, not really complicated program, but pretty complicated program like Adobe Dreamweaver that uh, you can use and you can pick it up. I'm sure you're all bright enough to figure it out. But it's a big investment of time to just go and put up a site and it's a little bit clunky the way that you have to go about doing it and select all the graphics. There are groups like uh, Intuit, Homestead, GoDaddy.com, Web.com. They already did all that for you and you can get a basic five page website which may all be all that you need. It, it's essentially an online brochure with a response mechanism that you can have for as little as five dollars a month going through these groups. They'll do all the work in terms of getting a domain name. You just have to pick a domain name that's unique and nobody else has and uh, they'll take care of all that part of it. They have templates that you can uh, start with and you know you plug a picture in here and you plug some text in here and you plug your navigation in here and you plug some contact information over here and maybe you say okay I don't like it it's blue I'd rather make it green and then you put your logo somewhere up at the top but it is really easy it's all click you know drag click and uh, drop and it's not hard at all to do you really can get a page uh, a, a, a page up uh, for your company in a couple three hours I'd say maybe exclusive of the writing whatever text you want to put up there and if you just want to put one page up there that's fine too but the fact of the matter is, is that for a lot of people, if, you're not, if you don't have a web presence, you don't exist to them. And it actually can, you know, can be a neg negator of a, a recommendation that you might get from somebody. Your neighbor or somebody that you're talking to, that, that, or a somebody who's a customer may talk to somebody that they worked with and said, hey, I had a great experience with Joe's septic and I know you've got septic problems. First thing, you know, first thing that person's going to do is they're going to see if Joe, see, find out, try to find out about Joe's septic. And if you're, if they don't find you on the web, with a website, the only thing they're going to find are they're going to find listings on things like Manta and Yelp uh, and uh, yellowpages.com and they may find negative stuff on you from Angie's List or whatever if you've got a disgruntled customer that's posted stuff. If you don't have a website up there, you don't exist for a lot of people. And you know, for even the GoDaddy sites and whatever, $5 a month, if that's too much and you're not willing to spend that, it take a slightly longer bit of time, but you can actually put up a website for free using a, a, a utility called WordPress. Now they call it a blogging uh, page, but there's no reason why you can't make it your web page. It, it has exactly the same features as a website that you get from GoDaddy or, or anywhere else. So I really encourage you, if you don't have a web page, to go ahead and put one up. Uh, and I, if you want more information on that, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Uh, number seven, email. Build an email list. I, I don't spam people, but email can be effective and it, is a, it, it still remains a way for people to uh, stay in contact with you. If it, if it wasn't effective, Barnes & Noble wouldn't be sending me something two, time, or two or three times a week on whatever the latest book is because I happen to buy a book from them once every six months. Uh, but I would recommend that you, when you're, using, when you're emailing, to, to limit it to once a quarter or once every month at, at the most, uh, maybe every, once every two months. Now the real trick is how do you build up an email list of your, uh, that's useful. 
Um, it may be or may not be that your current customers, you have emails on them. You can go ahead and email to them without worrying about any legal regulations. There is a law out, a federal law called CAN spam, which was originally intended to prevent those spammers that send Viagra and all those types of ads to your, to, to your uh, um, email. And it was basically to stop them, from, uh, stop them from doing that. And it sort of did because they all moved offshore where, where federal law doesn't apply. So really it only applies to businesses who really don't have the interest in um, sending out illegitimate material. Uh, but can spam has some rules. And one of them is, is that you have to give your customer an opportunity to opt out. So it might be that it's worthwhile to think about using a service like Constant Contact or any of about a dozen other email services that are out there. They're pretty low cost. Uh, you can send something out for a little, as much as a few cents a piece. Uh, the nice thing about that is, is that it's, it's real professional looking. You can put your graphics on it. You can do a lot of other things like that. But in terms of going beyond your customer list, if in fact you've even got email names for your customers, if you don't, go ahead and start. Just add it to the forms when people are filling stuff out. But chances are you probably have those names somewhere because in, in, at least for some of them, you probably want to communicate, you're already communicating them with them via email. But if you use a program like a Constant Contact, there are other cool little things you can do. Like you can put some, a little widget at the bottom that says forward to a friend. And then that Constant Contact will actually capture that email and, and, and as part of, uh, and it becomes part of your database. And you can legally mail to them because you had a, with, the, with your customers, you have a business relationship and it's perfectly fine to mail to them as long as they have the opportunity to opt out. But that business relationship goes one more generation. If you forward to a friend and that comes in, that's legal to go ahead and, and mail to those people, send an email to those people as well. You can do a contest. Uh, whether you, if, say, say you're at a county fair or something like that and you're collecting email addresses or you're, excuse me, collecting business cards. So you collect a business card. You actually, you've had a conversation with somebody about what you do. That constitutes legally a business relationship. So you, you are able to email them without going out initially and asking their permission. So you can do contests. Another thing that works really well is, is give them what, what's called in the business a freemium, which is a free premium. It could be a little tchotchke, it could be, uh, you know, like a, a, could be a refrigerator bag, but sometimes it's something that's really, you know, uh, something of value. Maybe it goes on your site, like you have somebody who comes to your site, and they found you because they're looking to have, you know, they need to have a tank installed, they need to find an installer. Uh, but they're looking at five or six different people. But if you have on your site, uh, download our free report on, you know, the 10 things you need to do to, to select a contractor or the 10 things you need to do to do this or that. Lists are great. People love those things. And they will give you your email. Yeah, and as part of the process of collecting it, you say you, you're going to send the email to them. So you can actually collect information about them. You know, what are you doing? What, what's your time frame? Or just simply say, give me your email address and I'll mail it to you. But once they've said, I want this, then you have a business relationship. So over time, you can build and continue to build an email list of, of contacts. And, and that's how you can make email work for you a little bit. Uh, sort of related to that, you might want to think about doing a newsletter. Uh, again, you know, maybe you only do it once a year or maybe once or twice a year. And that costs a little bit of money to print, although you can make it an electronic newsletter and send it out as one of the emails that you do. And the point is, is you talk a little bit about your services and you talk a whole lot about what interests the customer. Uh, whether that's and, and you know whether it's strictly wastewater related or it goes into other things like uh, say you know uh, how do you landscape a Wisconsin mound uh, because people care about those kinds of things but you can actually be a source for your source for your customer and you're building a trust relationship which is really what what you know customer service and customer relations are all about is developing a trust relationship between you as a company and that individual number nine Join a business networking group. Does anybody belong to a group like BNI or anybody like that? Uh, what, what do you belong to? I have got a successful Okay, all right, so you kind of know what I'm talking about here. Do you find that, that that's useful? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not your full. No, it can't, but it, does it, it can't be. Business networking groups, um, I, I belonged uh, uh, several years back when I had my consulting business with uh, uh, BNI, which is I think Business Network International is what they are. But it, it's a group and it's usually no more than 20 or 30 people in a, in a fairly limited or you know, similar geographic area. None of them can compete with anybody else. So if you're an installer, there won't be any other installers in your group. There could be a pumper, but there won't be an installer. Uh, but there might be you know, a, a plumber or an electrician or a house painter or a guy who goes around and picks up dog dew in somebody's backyard. But the point is that these groups, one of the ways that these groups are designed to work is, is that 
they're, you're, you're leveraging all of these people's contacts and their conversations with them. And, and you have a customer and you're uh, an electrician and then you start talking with this person and they're saying, yeah, yeah, we, this, that, and the other thing. And all of a sudden, oh no, yeah, yeah, our septic system seems like it's failing. Well, part of the goal of this network is, is that you share those leads with the people in your group and they'll share leads with you. And they meet like once a week or once every two weeks. It varies, it varies accordingly. You have a breakfast meeting and they really push you to be there and, and to be regular at that because it, this model doesn't work unless everybody's there. They're not cheap. They cost, um, I don't know what you, yours were, but I think mine was like three or four hundred bucks for a year to belong to that group. Um, I got one that's two hundred for a year, and I got another one that's seven hundred. Two hundred for a year, seven hundred for a year. So I was kind of in the middle with four hundred. But it's something if you're not if you if you if you're not doing it, it might be worth trying to see if you are in fact getting business from from that. Uh, you know, from that source, as I say, instead of you just being out there talking to the customers in your local area, you've got 20 or 30 other people who are talking to those same people, and they all keep their ears open, just as you would if somebody, you know, somebody was saying, geez, you know, it seems like I'm shorting out my, my circuit box all the time. Well, you call electric, you tell the electrician, hey, you know, I've got a lead for you. So, you know, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Number 10. Uh, booze, I say county fairs, but that's just a kind of a catch-all. It can be almost anything, but you know, it that doesn't cost much to have a little display that sits on a tabletop or one of those window shade uh, pull-up uh, exhibit displays. I mean, you'll see them in the exhibit hall, uh, and they only cost those things only cost about three or four hundred bucks uh, to have something like that, and that becomes your marketing image. And you, you pay a little bit for the gra you pay a little bit for the graphics, and, and then you're pretty much done. And you could take that to show after show after show, and you can. Use those, use those to build a personal one-to-one -one relationship with people. I mean, the people that you're going to talk to in those booths, I mean, you can do giveaways and people will come and they'll trick-or-treat at your, at your station, but you'll get people who will be really interested in what you're doing. And whether it's county fairs or maybe the health department is having, having an, uh, an, an event and they're inviting some of the people, you know, some of the vendors on you know, wastewater treatment, or it could be anything. It could be the JCs or the Chamber of Commerce or whatever it happens to be. But there's all sorts of events out there that uh, maybe reaching your, cu your particular customer base and uh, I know people who use this method and they find that it's very useful and it's really the only marketing that they do. Outdoor advertising, number 11. Um, I like this one. I'm not talking about billboards, although if, if you find a billboard that hits, you know, hits your service area and you can get it for a song, I guess you can do that. But I'm really talking, I'm really talking more about uh, things like signs on your trucks. I, I, I was, it was interesting. I, I saw all the trucks that were in the Marriott lot uh, where I'm staying. Uh, and I'm guessing a lot of them are people uh, who are at this conference. Uh, Several of them had signs on the truck, several of them didn't. Now maybe those people just have magnetic signs that they take off when they're not actually using them for business purposes. But you know, a sign on your truck is a rolling ad for you. And I mean, if you're a pumper, and you see, I, I've seen some pumpers that have their, you know, their whole tank and everything you know, painted, and, and they've got you know, cartoons and all sorts of fancy graphics on it. But even if it's just you know, Joe Smith septic phone number, uh, this is what we do, and it's just three or four lines, that actually you know, is, is generally enough for people. They just want to know what you are and what you're doing. You could take that a couple of steps further by getting yard signs like politicians use, uh, when you know, people use for po politics. And you put those in the front yards when you're doing a job, whether you're doing an install that takes two or three days. As long as the customer gives you permission, you say, you know, this job being done by XYZ company. Uh, you can also, and, and this varies, and you, you do want to check to make sure that legally you can do this, but another thing you might want to think about is buying small signs, uh, you know, 8 by 10 signs that you tack up on uh, periodically, like every half mile or so down, down a road on, on telephone poles or whatever, or at, at intersections. Uh, there are people that do that, and they find that that's a very successful, successful method for them. Uh, as sort of an aside, uh, NARA is about to actually roll out a science program where we think that we can offer signs like that to you for, uh, for much less than you can probably even source locally on that. But um, I'm not going to talk anymore about that. My point isn't to advertise NARA, it's to help you guys uh, advertise what you're doing. Uh, another area that's really important is customer service. And um, I don't really need to say much more about that except that, you know, the more your customers are happy with you, the more they're going to recommend you, and the more things you can do, uh, you know, in, in terms of stretching that relationship and preventing a bad relationship. Uh, the first thing, and, and this may seem obvious to most of you, and it probably is, but really, appearances and neatness really does matter. If you roll up to a job site and you're in a beat-up truck and you're wearing ratty clothes, 
and uh, you've got all sorts of crap in the cab and then a whole bunch of stuff just all disorganized in the back. That creates an impression and it creates the, not the impression that you probably want. As somebody who's not very organized and they don't really care enough to take care of their own equipment, are they really going to do the job that I hired them to do? And, and so it really does make a difference. So, you know, you have a clean truck. You know, don't have junk everywhere. Dress presentably. You don't have to dress in a jacket or anything like that. Just, just have a nice presentable look or maybe even a uniform or shirts. Maybe some of you already do that. But it really does make a difference and it does make an impression on your customers. There's no question about that. If you're a business owner, handle complaints personally. Don't leave it to your employees to do it. Uh, you're the one who needs to make sure that this, ensure that this business goes forward. If you become aware of a complaint, it's really incumbent on you to do what you can to address it, hopefully in a matter that's satisfactory, satisfactory to both parties. It used to be that there was a rule that, um, you know, that, that for every happy customer you had, they told one to three people, and for every un unhappy customer, they told ten people. Well, that's probably still true, and they probably still do that on the word of mouth basis. But then you have and the whole additional a aspect of the internet where a really bad review on Angie's list, Angie's list puts you in the penalty box, and you're rather than being an A or a B rated provider, you're a D rated provider, and nobody wants to go, nobody wants to do business with you. So it's really important to, to, to fix those. It's also why it's important to monitor your online reputation, which is another one of the things that uh, I, I, I mentioned here. In fact, it might even be the next one. Now, the next one is just leave behinds. It doesn't cost, you know, the, the most expensive brochure that you print or business card that you print is the very first one that comes off the press because that pays for the pressman's time, the ink, uh, and all the labor that was going to set it up. Once that's done, it's just paper that's running through the presses. And so, you know, you can print 500 brochures for $50. You can print 5,000 brochures for about $125. I mean, I'm just using numbers, but it's, you're only paying for the paper. You're not paying for all this upfront setup. So go ahead and run some extra ones, even if you don't think you're going to use them, and, and have your people or, or you yourself go to those individuals. And uh, when, when, you, when you finish a, finish a job, you know, ask them, you know, can I, can I leave you a couple extra business cards or can I leave you a couple extra brochures? And if you're happy with it, would you mind telling your neighbors or, you know, if, if somebody asked you that, you that you were happy with what you did? People will generally say yes, and if they are happy with the job, then you've got somebody there, and they've got something, and they can actually be your sales force, and you don't have to necessarily be there. They'll uncover leads for you. Again, this isn't rocket science, but it's, it's something that I'm surprised more people don't do that on a regular basis. Um, another thing, number 15, is find a memorable tchotchke to give to clients, and that can be any number of, of different things. This is one that I happen to be kind of, kind of fond of. It, you know those uh, stress balls that are you know, just round stress balls? This is a stress toilet. Uh, it was Loudon Water uh, out, out in Virginia did this. Uh, and you know, it, it squeezes and it's just like a stress ball. But it's memorable because it kind of, you know, they're, the, they're a water utility in, in Northern Virginia. And this is, what they, uh, this is what they did. I'll pass it around if you want to see it. Just, uh, just to have it. But you know, a little leave behind that, that, that reminds the customer that you're there, that, that you're there especially if, it, if you're in a, some type of recurring business uh, with, that, with that customer. Uh, it could be a refrigerator magnet. You know, it could be uh, uh, you know, pens or a pad with your company name on it that you hand out or maybe you give at the end of a job to a customer or you hand out at county fairs or uh, you say, you put it on your website and you say, you know, Give us your email address and we'll send you a pad. You can use them for a lot of different reasons, but the idea is to have something that somebody is actually going to use and have in front of them, <clears throat> or a great, better chance of having in front of them where your name and your branding is, is top of mind. And that's kind of the reason to, to have some kind of like little specialty advertising item. And all you, there are tons of companies out there. You probably already work with a couple, and they've got catalogs, and there's lots of ideas you, that they can come up with. And a lot of those people are very creative. And they can even suggest things once you explain to them what the nature is that you're, of your business and how you want to use it. They can often come up with something that's really inexpensive, and yet it can be pretty effective in terms of generating business. Nothing builds your credibility more than citing sources that are credible um, and, and providing customers with information from other credible sources beyond you. They know that you've got you know, your own self-interest in building the, business or build, building the business or whatever, but there is a ton of information out there that's very consumer-focused. 
Uh, you can find it on the NARA website, you can find it on the EPA website, the National Environmental Services Center website. It's all just, you know, telling consumers different aspects about on-site systems uh, and, and every step in the process from selecting somebody all the way through to, you know, how often do you need to have your tank pumped to kind of what's happening out here right now, which is, uh, you know, how do you keep your, how do you keep the pipes in your, in your septic system from freezing when there's no snow cover to keep the, uh, keep the uh, permafrost from uh, going further down and freezing the pipes. So there's all sorts of things that you can do, or floods, that's another one. Iowa is kind of famous for having, the, you know, having, having floods, at least it has in the last decade or so. Uh, and there's all sorts of things that you can do to help people prevent their septic systems from going bad and literature that you can give them or put on your website. But having some credible information that's not just buy something from me, but here I'm trying to help you m extend the life of your system or, or do it right from the start. Those are, those are very powerful things that add your credibility and strengthen the trust that, that is inherent in any customer uh, business relationship. Number 17, do a customer appreciation event or, or a gesture in some way. It could be anything from if you move to a new, new location, you do an open house for your, for your customers and you know, say come by and get some barbecue or whatever and have a, have a little catered event. It can be anything like that to simply uh, you know, at the end of the year, maybe you mail somebody a calendar saying I just wanted to thank you for your business. But you do something to express appreciation for the customer and it could be you know, the little a little squeeze thing. I mean, even that even that works. But the idea is is, is 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 show some appreciation, show them some love, and they'll show you some love back. Uh, and there's any number of different things that you can you can do in that regard, whether it's an event or whether it, it it's, it's something. I know people who simply at the end of the year take take their customer list and say, I just wanted to personally thank you for being a customer, and we hope we lived up to your expectations, and we look forward to the opportunity to work with you again. Thanks a lot. Period. See you later. And 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 they get off stage. It can be very useful to do that. Another thing that um, I find has value is follow up with new customers three to six months after you've completed your first job with them. Not necessarily to sell them if it comes up, great, but call them and, and make sure that if you put it put in a tank that everything's working correctly or if they have any questions or, or what have you. And, Demonstrate to them that, that you care not just about making the sale, but you care that you've got a satisf satisfied customer. And you may, get th you may hear things that you didn't even know were, were you might not have even realized were going on. Uh, and it might be an early warning system if something is going wrong. But it's a really good way for you to be proactive and rather than have the customer get all upset because something went wrong, and maybe it was even their fault, uh, you know, those ATUs, it's real easy for a customer to screw something up and it's real easy for uh, any, any consumer to just not realize that all that uh, all that stuff that they just flushed down the toilet clogged up their filters and they're no longer able to process anything and it's backing up. So there's all sorts of reasons why you'd want to follow up, but it's a good step to do. And it, again, it doesn't cost you any money to do it. It's just a little bit of time. But goodness gr gracious, I mean, you know, once a quarter, take all your new customers from the previous quarter and find a rainy day when you're not out, not able to go out and work anyhow. And use that as the day that you're going to say, I'm going to call my customers today, or my, my new customers, and see what's going on. Public relations. I love public relations because public relations is free publicity. And, and I'm really big on free. Um, you'd be surprised how easy it is to submit articles on uh, what you do to your local newspapers. Maybe some of you have already done that already. And if so, you know, good, good on you for doing that. Uh, but um, um, newspapers are typically hungry for content. Uh, they're all uh, hurting in terms, of, in terms of revenue and they've cut back staff and they're looking for things that are you know, somewhat authoritative and they're more often than not, they're willing to take an article from, from you and the worst they can do is you can call them and say, you know, I've got some ideas about an article I was thinking about submitting. Would, you, would this be something you'd be willing to publish? Some people would say, no, we only write original content. But there are a lot of newspapers out there that will take things, whether it's an article from you or a press release or almost anything, uh, pictures even, to, to, to fill space and to provide something that still has value for, the, for, for their readers. Um, somewhat related to that is, is you can take a strategy of seeing your, trying to position yourself as the go-to authority. It kind of even goes back to this last thing about writing articles. The more articles that you write, and the more things that you publish or you get published in different places, the more, the more people are going to see you as the, as the go-to person in your area for, for that. 
And that can also lead to other things uh, because one of the next things I'm going to say is cultivate relations not with, not just send articles to them, but, but get to know uh, you know, the producers at the local news stations and uh, the editor, uh, even if it's just sending a letter saying, you know, I just thought I'd, I'd let you know that, you know, if you ever run into issues uh, where you have questions about how a septic tank works or how often it should be pumped or what's involved with doing service or O&M on, on a system, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good authority. I've published a couple of articles. Here's some links to those or, or what have you, or here's copies of them. You can, you, you can read them yourselves. And most editors and reporters and producers have Rolodexes that are like this big. And that's because they, the more sources they have when they need, when, when, an art, when a story comes up, the more people that they can come talk to uh, or identify, the happier they are. And so they're almost always willing to accept your information and your business card and they'll make notes in terms of what it's all about. But if somebody's going to go on a local radio or television program or they're going to be interviewed in a newspaper and quoted in a newspaper, wouldn't it rather be you than the guy down the street? So um, it, again, it doesn't, doesn't cost money. It does take some time to write the articles. But you all are smart people. You understand what this business is. Um, and if you're not really comfortable with you know, the, the way that you write, you still can put the basic thing together and, and ask somebody to, to edit it for you or just proofread it. You, you do want to have it be grammatically correct. But that's you know, beyond that, just again, speak from the heart and speak about what you know. And people will consider you, and people will consider you the authority. I mentioned this a little bit briefly earlier and also earlier today, uh, is pay attention to your online reputation, whether it's Facebook or whether it's Angie's List or whether it's any number of customer review sites or uh, anything um, that's out there in terms of directory listings. It's really, it really helps if you or maybe if you, if you don't like to be online or you're just not comfortable doing that, but if there's somebody else or you have a kid who's, who's comfortable with it, ask them to Google you and maybe use a couple of the other tools to find out what people are saying about you online, if they're saying anything about you. They may not be. But if you don't know, and there are things out there, your business is being crushed and you don't even know it. So it really does help to know what's out there. Because even if you don't have a web page, even if you don't go online, you may not even have an email address. That's just not how you work. That doesn't matter. You still have an online presence. I guarantee you, you Google your company's name, you will get results on Google. It might only be three or four. It might be 40 or 50. But you will get results. You have a presence. It's worth looking at to see what people are saying about you. And with, the on, with those directories, the yellowpages.coms and the mantas and all that, a lot of times they just sweep information from, from uh, public records, uh, a lot of which is five, ten years old, whatever it happens to be. And as I was saying earlier, you, know, you may live on 120, you know, you may have at one time lived on 123 Main Street, but you don't live there anymore, or you don't work there, your office isn't there anymore, you moved, you know, years ago to another location. But that street location from ten years ago may, may be what's on your online listing for that particular group. Uh, or the phone number could be wrong, or you know, the name of the owner could be wrong, or the directions to get there could be wrong. But there's, there are things, and almost all those uh, uh, directories have ways for you to go in and correct that information once you claim, you say, hey, that's my company, it's got inaccurate information, you can fix it. And they'll also sometimes, often, there's, there's, you can also pay for all, all add-ons, but you, often there are ways that you can actually put more descriptive information in there about what you're doing. When people are coming from out of town and they're looking at Dubuque and they're going, okay, I need a septic tank, I'm moving to Dubuque and we're moving to the country outside there and I know we're going to have a tank and I want to find an installer and they're in California, and that was the example somebody used earlier today. Um, and they go on there and they see you, um, maybe they'll see your web page, but maybe it won't be the first thing that comes up and they'll see a listing for you on Yelp. Uh, and they go to that and it says that your company is somewhere where you haven't been in three years. Well, they're not, they're not going to follow up and stay with you. But, so you've just lost a potential lead that you could have closed because your information online isn't accurate. So I really encourage you to spend some time. Uh, you don't have to do it all the time and it's not a big investment. But take a little bit of time and, and have some, either do it yourself or have somebody look it up for you and, 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 and see where you are with your online reputation and, and if it's accurate and if people are saying nasty things about you. And if they're saying nasty things about you, there are ways to, to, to fix that as well. But you can, you can have your business destroyed by bad reviews online. Understand the value of press releases. Press releases are, are ways for you to stay in the news 
Uh, and a lot of newspapers will publish press releases or excerpt press releases from just about everybody they, they receive it from as long as they're not getting a press release a day. And what do you put in a press release? Well, it can be a lot of different things. I mean, again, if you move to a new location or you've got an employee that's just uh, hit a 20-year milestone and you recognize them with a party or you gave them a gift and take a picture of it, send it to the newspaper, write a, write a short article about that person and all the great service that they've done. And it doesn't have to be much and press releases are not hard to do. There, there are sort of technically accepted formats but nobody, re there's no one format to follow. Basically all I have to do is say news release at the top, put a date on it, and have the first sentence say what, whatever the lead is for what, you're, what you want to communicate. It could be a new piece of equipment that you've just secured. It could be uh, uh, you know, the completion of your 100th uh, you know, installation or your 1,000th installation. Pick a number that's sort of a milestone number. Any number of things that you can do. And, and once every quarter or so, go ahead and send that out to the local newspapers. I mean, you've got newspapers like, uh, I guess, the Des Moines Register, which is a you know, big grown-up newspaper that has reporters and and even there they'll, some, they'll, they'll take some press releases but as you go down down market in terms of size of newspapers and you get into the newspapers that you know are, are advertisers or whatever they love press releases and they'll print your press releases sometimes verbatim you know you get six inches of ink out of, uh, in a newspaper article because you wrote a six uh, a press release that, that equates to six inches six column inches of type so press releases have a lot of value in terms of keeping your name in front of the customer they, they also build and add to you know, whatever authority if you are trying to set yourself up as a go-to authority. Just one more way to keep your name in front of the public when the time comes that the public needs your particular service. How am I doing on time here? Pretty good, about 15 minutes. Uh, and be visible locally. Um, this is probably obvious, but you know, the Elks, the Oddfellows, the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary Club, yeah, getting active in those, it's not quite the same as uh, a, a business networking group, but it, there's a lot of similarities there, and uh, a lot of the people that you're going to be dealing with may potentially be customers, and, and once you develop those relationships, it'll come back to you. I'm sure most of you belong to that, so I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, leverage your customers. Your customers are one of your best sources of new business and the more you can do to take advantage of that, the better off it is for you and there's a lot of different ways you can leverage your customers. First of all, um, one important thing about marketing is, is measurement. You know, I talked about you know, the, the liquor and guesswork. Well, um, the guesswork can be removed a little bit by simply every time you get a lead uh, for, for a new piece of business, you ask them and you record, how did you hear about me? And that will give you an idea on what parts of whatever marketing you're doing or working and what parts don't seem to be making, making any headway in, in what you're doing. You may find that you're doing a lot of things and you've got stuff coming in from six different sources and great if that's the case. But if not, that's a really good way for you to kind of narrow your focus or maybe throw a few more dollars or a few, little bit more effort into whatever happens to be working and whatever your customers and your prospective customers are telling you. So. Um, always ask your customer how they heard about you. When you're done with a job, survey them about um, uh, their satisfaction for the job. And it doesn't have to be a big questionnaire. It's just, were you happy with the work? Did we you know, arrive on time? Did you have any questions or concerns? Um, and did you have any other comments that you'd like to make? One of the nice things about that is, is that if you really did a bang up job on something and, and, and you've given people you know, three or four or five questions to answer and maybe they've checked some boxes and it's you know, uh, you know, 10 out of 10 or whatever it happens to be, that's great. But they may also write at the bottom, you know, great job, I will recommend you to my friends or something like that. That can actually be a testimonial. As long as you get their permission, you can then take that, you can put it in your brochures, you can put it on your website, and you can also go out to customers that you know are happy and ask them to write a testimonial for you or even draft one and say, is this accurate and can I put your name on it? But these may come organically just simply by surveying them and finding out how well you've done. And it's just a good practice to find out whether the customer's happy with the work anyhow, because if you can head off those problems now or, or just something, somebody is disgruntled now, uh, before it really devolves into a nasty situation, you're better off. And I mentioned collect customer testimonials, so I'm gonna go ahead and go past that. So we're gonna move to number 27. Um, offer discounts for prompt payment. Um, 
the, this is standard in accounting and finance and billing that's net 30, which is basically 2% off the bill if they pay you within 30 days of when the, when the bill was, uh, was mailed to them. You could do this one of two ways. You can jack your prices up a little bit to cover that 2%, uh, and then you're actually making some gravy on the other end. Or you can look at it from the terms of how much time are you spending collecting that debt, and what's that worth to you, and is, it, you know, is the 2% that, that, that they might get as a discount for prompt payment actually going to be worthwhile for you. But you know, the less time you spend collecting means the more time you can spend doing your job and developing your business. And so I would encourage you to offer your customers uh, some discounts for prompt payment, just like a lot of your vendors probably do for you as well can also offer your customers a finder's fee. Now, uh, on-site's a little bit different just because um, in, in a lot of communities, people are a little further spread apart. And so uh, you know, maybe the conversations don't, don't, don't take place as much as they do in a suburban area where people talk across the backyard all the time. But you know, if, if somebody can bring you business um, you know, and you can offer them some kind of finder's fee for doing it, or even let them know that, hey, if you refer somebody to me and that turns into a job, I will pay you 25 bucks, or I will give you a gift card, or I will uh, give you a tchotchke, or whatever it happens to be. But give them an incentive to help you grow your business by simply you know, offering them something tangible in exchange for their good words about you, which leads to a sale for, for you. So I'd, I'd encourage that as well. Okay, coming in on the home stretch, um, inside your company. And this is sort of a catch-all category, but um, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I, I think is very important and, and really I think is part of marketing is, is coming to events like, like this uh, or other events or professional gatherings where you're continuing your education. Um, that's where you get your new ideas. You're not, you know, if, if you're in Ann Kenny, you're probably not going to get much from the other competitors that you have there, but somebody who's on the other end of the state that you meet at this meeting and they're doing something different than what you're doing and you can get an idea from them or a technique that is a little bit easier than the way you were doing it, you know, those are the kinds of things that, are, that, that make those conferences valuable and pay for themselves. You get ideas that you can go back and implement yourself. So, you know, continue to do the, keep doing the continuing education um, like you have been doing and congratulations to all of you for coming here because you guys get that, obviously get that. Uh, and it really does make a difference in terms of, you know, innovation comes from a lot of different areas, but the more outside influences that you get, the more likely you are to come up with an innovative idea. You know, they say one definition of insanity is doing this, you know, running into a brick wall over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, you know, it's sort of the same thing with, with marketing is, is that, you know, if you just keep doing the same thing over and over again um, and you're expecting your business to grow and you're not measuring, you're not doing anything, you're not introducing any new ideas or new techniques, how are you really going to grow your business? So go to conferences, get involved in, in, in your industry because it will pay you back uh, in terms of ideas and contacts and networks that you make. Incent your employees to go out and uh, do that. Maybe some of you do that already, but there's no reason why. I mean, if you've got somebody who's working a site and they're doing an install and somebody sees a sign out front and they come down the driveway and they ask you, you know, about your company, you don't want your employee to say, well, just call my boss, here's his card. You want him to be really fired up about it and, and, and say, yeah, we're a really good company. These are all the things we do. Look at how, look, 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 look at how deep we put the, the, the gravel under this pit. Look how even it is. Look at this tank. It's perfect. It's pristine. The seal goes all the way around. You know, wh whatever. Get them enthusiastic about it, and if, if that referral turns into a sale, give them some type of incentive. It can be money. It doesn't have to be money. It can be uh, you know, a, a coupon to Olive Garden, or it could be tickets to a baseball game. It could be anything like that. But your employees, if they're not, you know, even if they're not your salespeople, if you have salespeople, even, even if they're uh, you know, your line workers and you know, they're the guy that runs the backhoe and, and he doesn't, have, he's, um, that's, that's where his specialty is. He can still be an evangelist for your business, but giving him a little bit of a reason to be that evangelist is good. Is that my five minute signal? Boy, I'm right on time. Yeah. All right, and deliver more than you promised. Um, that kind of speaks for itself. I promised you 30, that's number 31, so I've delivered more than I promised. Um, and with that, I am done. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Sorry? 27. 
offer discounts for prompt payment. Don't forget to fill out your evaluation forms and you can leave them on the table, they'll correct them. And I think there's somebody out in the back that'll stamp your CEU cards. Thank you.